Hello everyone. Now welcome back. This is our final lecture on the theme of empires of the ancient world. Uh, it is the second of two lectures dealing with imperial traditions and civilizations outside of Eurasia. Uh, and today in particular we're looking at Native American civilizations uh, of the Western Hemisphere uh, in the age before European arrival. What I'm calling the landscapes of empire. And as you can see from the picture here, there are some impressive landscapes indeed. During the uh, lecture on uh, West African empires, we looked at uh, a chart that your author Robert Strayer uh, posts in the textbook on global populations during the classical era. And we noted that uh, from this period that he outlines here from 400 BCE to 1000 CE, a period that overlaps but actually extends beyond the classic age of empire, that the world's population was concentrated most notably 41% uh, nearly half of the world's population uh, on the continent of Eurasia and so empires such as China uh, and Persia uh, and the Roman Empire would have comprised the great population centers of the world at that time by comparison Africa uh, had about a fifth, the entire continent of Africa, about a fifth of the world's population. In considering North and South America, that is the Western Hemisphere, we get just over 30 percent, about 31 percent, uh, almost a third of the world's population uh, during this period, uh, which makes it therefore one of the three major population centers, one of the three supercontinents, if you will, North America, South America, Central America combined. Keeping in mind, of course, that the overall numbers, the aggregate numbers, are far less than they would be today for global population, uh, which has a lot to do, of course, with the tremendous population boom in our own time, the modern age. Uh, prior to the modern age, population growth from the origins of civilization were fairly uh, consistent and uh, fairly static compared to what they would become in the modern era. According to Strayer, again, classical era civilizations in Africa and the Americas were fewer in number and generally smaller than those of Eurasia and larger numbers of people, of their people, lived in communities that did not feature cities and states. So overall, that is a picture, at least, of population distribution during the period we are studying. And yet, as we'll see, uh, Native America, that is, the Americas before the arrival of Europeans, at the time of Columbus. Native America uh, held great civilizations in its grasp, including urban civilizations nonetheless. The classical era of Native American civilization is a little bit different than it is for Eurasian. We, we said 500 to 500, 500 BCE to 500 CE for Eurasia. And Native America scholars consider the period 250 to 900 CE to be the classic era. But however we wish to uh, set the time frame, uh, it's uh, undeniably true, indisputably true, that by the time Europeans arrived in the Western Hemisphere during the age of Columbus, that is Columbus's famous voyage of 1492 CE, uh, that nearly 3,000 years of civilization had marked the pre-Columbian pre history of Native American civilization. Uh, and yet, in the minds of Europeans of Columbus's day, uh, and ever since, uh, the stereotypical, highly biased, culturally biased, ethnocentrically biased view of the Western Hemisphere 
was that civilization only arrived with the Europeans. Uh, and uh, as we're going to see today, that had a lot more to do with the demands of European imperialism uh, than it did the actual evidence base of history. And uh, speaking of evidence, some of it is quite profound, uh, attesting to the civilizations that existed in ancient Native America that had nothing to do with either Europeans or the European arrival. You know, the, the problem with ancient history, of course, is that it's, you know, if ancient history were a hundred piece jigsaw puzzle, then, you know, maybe 93 of the pieces are missing. Uh, but the pieces that remain are impressive. Those that withstand the ravages of time, the effects of weathering and that sort of thing are impressive. One need only consider the colossal heads of the Olmec people of Mexico, the ancient Olmec people of Mexico, who uh, a thousand years uh, before even the Aztecs uh, had not only sculpted these uh, monumental uh, heads uh, from stone, uh, but had uh, established the basis of civilization in Mexico that would continue for uh, 3,000 years uh, to the time of European arrival, uh, ranging in height from uh, 4 feet to over 10 feet and weighing between 25 and 50 tons. These uh, monumental carvings not only attest to the skill uh, of the masons and sculptors among the Olmec, but also the, the, the general wherewithal of the Olmec civilization uh, to contribute its own monumental artifacts in the way that we've seen other civilizations have done, carved from rock, the most lasting of all uh, imperial monuments. But there are others. Uh, such as the great earthen monuments of North America. Perhaps the most impressive and famous is that of the great serpent mound in modern day Ohio, uh, which made entirely uh, of earth uh, stretches uh, over 1300 feet in length uh, from the tip of the serpent's coiled tail through its serpentine windings uh, to the tips of its open jaws and what most scholars figure is uh, most likely a representation uh, made of earth here of an egg, uh, perhaps a bird's egg. Uh, it, it looks a bit like a donut, uh, but I doubt that ancient serpents in North America were eating donuts. So. Uh, this is, again, a ceremonial expression, a monumental expression of a culture and civilization that was located in the Great Lakes region, um, in this case, modern, uh, the modern state of Ohio, uh, between 900 BCE and 1500 50 BC, uh, CE, excuse me, a period of nearly 2,500 years uh, attributed to those people that scholars refer to as the Adena people or Adena culture. This is the sort of evidence, of course, that was hidden in plain sight from Europeans who insisted uh, that it was either simply the work of lost civilizations uh, seeing as how they were unprepared to believe that the native people themselves could have been responsible, great and exotic theories of lost civilizations, travelers from outer space, uh, this kind of wild and imaginative speculation that really had nothing to do with the evidence uh, before them. Uh, had they been more inclined to see the native peoples of the Americas uh, as uh, capable of civilization instead of simply being subjects for European uh, imperialism, then they would have seen not only a long history, but a wide variety of cultures and civilizations stretching the length 
of the Western Hemisphere, from Alaska in the north to South America, the tip of South America. At the time of European arrival in the 1500s, the age of Columbus and the Spanish and the Portuguese arrival, at least 12 major centers of distinctive civilization, Native American civilization, existed uh, then at that time. And those civilizations themselves were simply the descending civilizations of even older and more ancient civilizations that preceded them. So not only are we talking about a long tenure of civilization and culture, but an incredible variety as well. It was easy again for Europeans to see native people as somehow all the same, to call them Indians after all, and kind of lump them together in one single stereotypical cluster. But in fact, we know that they were not the same. Their languages, their habits, their cultures, their ecologies varied widely uh, across the vast stretch of the Western Hemisphere. And so it's that that I want to look at in this lecture, that, that diversity, that ecology of civilization. And truth be told, it's a history that is still evolving. Why? Because we're playing catch up with Native America. We, as modern scholars looking back, are continually finding new evidence, reinterpreting old evidence, formulating new interpretations, hypotheses to tell the true story of pre-Columbian Native America. And, you know, in almost any given week uh, of the year, in a newspaper or magazine or online article, one can find reports of new evidence, uh, new interpretation, ancient mysteries solved. You know, we tend to call something in history a mystery when we just haven't figured it out, when we just haven't looked closely enough at the evidence, uh, because after all, who doesn't love a mystery? But as it turns out, the peoples of Native America were no more mysterious than the peoples of, oh, say, um, Mesopotamia or uh, the Nile River of Egypt or ancient China or Persia or any of the great civilization, imperial civilizations we have considered. In some cases, you know, it's, it's modern science coming to the rec rescue, whether it be carbon dating of ancient uh, corn uh, uh, kernels of ancient corn or genetic uh, analysis of ancient food crops. Uh, what science has contributed to the story is a much clearer and more precise sense of how these ancient peoples ate, uh, the clothes they wore, the structures they built. In other words, the things that otherwise, unlike stone, would tend not to survive uh, the ravages of time can now be investigated through scientific processes. Contrary to the mythologies of Europeans, Native America was not an untouched wilderness. You know, it was popular in the time of Columbus right on down really to the modern uh, societies, uh, European uh, descended societies such as the United States, uh, seeing Native peoples as simplistic, as primitive, as uh, you know, inferior to the civilizing impulses of Europe and to even mythologize them in the context of the European imagination, you know, to see in the context of the Judeo-Christian imagination, the native peoples of America as a kind of primordial people who lived in the wilderness or who, like the ancient biblical peoples, you know, lived in sort of, you know, pre-godly uh, you know, existences or something like as if, you know, all of the Americas was a kind of Garden of Eden. What, uh, again, modern research has shown, however, is that the Americas were nothing like that at, at all. Wherever native populations centered uh, from the time of the last ice age down to the arrival of Columbus 
Well, what we see are human societies doing what human societies do everywhere globally uh, during this period of agriculture, this period of civilization in world history. Uh, they were working the land. They were tapping into their ecologies of civilization. And you can see on this map here the so-called humanized landscapes before 1492. Far from being noble savages or, or nature's noblemen living in some simplistic harmony with what nature could provide, Native American peoples went to work and their projects of work are breathtaking. Whether it was uh, clearing forests uh, with fire or growing food crops here in eastern woodlands, agroforestry, whether it was creating massive irrigation projects in the dry southwest, whether it was creating terraced farmings uh, in the uh, Andes Mountains of South America, or creating the kind of earthen works that we saw in ancient Ohio. Uh, these landscapes were not natural and untouched. They were re-engineered by human beings, by Native American people, not by aliens, not by lost uh, and mysterious races of people, but by the ancestors of modern Native people who uh, put their own imprint on what we call the humanized landscapes of the Western Hemisphere. And that is from North America, for example, the great Mississippian cultures. Remember the Mississippi River, much like the Niger River or the Nile River or the Tigris and Euphrates Rivers, formed a kind of artery of life for Native American people. If you imagine the great mountain chains uh, of the east and west, the Appalachian crest here in the east and the continental divide, the divide, the Rocky Mountains of the west, and how from the watersheds of these great mountain chains flow uh, some of the great North American rivers like the Ohio River flowing off the Appalachian on its western watershed draining into the basin of the Mississippi or from the Rocky Mountains from the eastern watershed, the great Missouri River or Arkansas rivers that likewise flow into the drainage of the Mississippi. Naturally, as we have seen in other global civilizations, these great rivers form the arteries of commerce and trade, and in North America, a tradition of so-called mound building, that is, great earthen works uh, that could be sculpted and conform to the purposes of the people. One of the most famous uh, here is that of Cahokia. Cahokia near modern St. Louis, Missouri, modern day St. Louis, Missouri. Cahokia was the center of a Mississippi trade culture that not only connected uh, far-flung uh, points uh, as far west as the Colorado Rockies, as far east as the Appalachian Range, but also uh, through the tributaries of the Mississippi, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and the coastal stretches of the Gulf uh, to the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. So along these trade routes of coastal and river waterways, uh, then civilizations, native, <coughs> ancient Native American civilizations were connected through trade and commerce and found cultural exchange. Uh, Cahokia most likely was a ceremonial center that, exhi that exhibited and extolled the wealth of the Cahokian uh, rulers who, after all, took advantage of their location at a critical connecting point of the Mississippi. Uh, and like ancient toll keepers, uh, derived revenue from that trade and built, among other things, their ceremonial mounds, uh, which today as you can see from aerial photography, are still quite recognizable, though if you were this person driving along the highway in a car, you might assume it was a natural hill formation. It isn't. It was a man-made earthen pyramid, the largest ever constructed in world history. One basket of earth at a time, encompassing hundreds of thousands of man hours in labor. This monk's mound, as it's called, was 
the result of a centrally planned uh, economy, a centralized uh, governing structure that could mobilize the resources of the Mississippian peoples uh, in one of the great architectural uh, monumental projects of all time. Uh, here's what it may have looked like at its height with the ceremonial houses atop the mounds, most likely priestly functions um, con connecting the peoples of Cahokia to the ancestor spirits, the, the natural spirits uh, whom they credited with their life and vitality. And even today, the ruins are quite impressive. A national park is Cahokia near St. Louis. To the engineered landscapes of South America and some of the most ambitious civilizing efforts ever undertaken in the majestic Andes Mountain range of South America from the coastal plains to the highlands of Peru, great civilizations resided. We know of the Incas because it was the Inca, Incas who met the Spanish on their arrival in the 16th century. But long before the Incas, a chain of civilizations stretching back had rooted themselves in the region of the Andes. The Chavin culture, for example, along the coastal plains of modern Peru at the crossroads of north and south and east and west. The Chavin culture developed a distinctive architecture, uh, including uh, royal uh, buildings and palaces, but also handmade crafted uh, items, uh, including pottery and painted textiles uh, that find their place in the great museums uh, today. But the Chavin were just one of several, as you see from the key here that spread from the plains and the Andean foothills of Peru uh, through uh, what is now the modern states of Bolivia and Chile. Uh, among those constructed cities, some of the most challenging uh, environments to support the urban populations. The Tiwanaku uh, developed a raised field agriculture in the estuarial plains uh, at the base, at the at the base of the Andes, the foothills of the Andes. Uh, they raised the earth above the watery plains uh, to create uh, regular yields of agricultural produce that could support the urban civilizations. Uh, in the case of the Wari, uh, it was steppe uh, terraced agriculture uh, carved right into uh, the steep hillsides of the uh, lower Andes here that supported harvest sufficient uh, to support, as I say, urban populations. Uh, some of the stone cut remnants of those urban populations include things like archways and doorways and, and uh, um, you know, rock platforms and uh, pillars, uh, columns. These are the things that survive time. These are the pieces uh, that withstand uh, the elements uh, and leave us with precious evidence. Centuries before the Inca of Peru. There were the civilizations we call Tiwanaku and Wari, located in western Bolivia and Peru, comprising a network of cities that featured grand architecture and large populations. Tiwanaku and Wari exploited the extreme climate differences of the Pacific coastal plain, what geographers call the Altiplano or High Plains, and the rugged Andes Mountains to combine a fishing industry with fruit and vegetable and grain production. So uniting the ecologies of the Andes with the coastal fisheries to create a basis, a productive basis for great civilizations that stretch the classical era centuries, centuries before the arrival of Europeans. Uh, some of the most famous expressions of these civilizations still take our breath away. 
uh, the great uh, line drawings, earthen line drawings of the Nazca uh, people of, uh, of, of, of modern day Peru uh, look like great signatures from the sky. Uh, what they were was a landscape of a humanized landscape of geometry and art and ritual. Uh, the landscape drawings of the Nazca, a people who lived along the southern coast of Peru, uh, an otherwise rather featureless plain, a flat, rather barren featureless plain, it seemed, became like a great artist canvas to the Nazca people who drew on that canvas uh, effigy figures such as uh, animals, monkeys, pelicans, hummingbird, and what you see here, a dog uh, from aerial view, a dog figure carved into the earth, uh, representative not only of their mathematical and engineering sophistication, but again, their ability to mobilize labor on a large scale. These figures stretch for miles across the flat, barren plains of Peru. Uh, and they accomplished this by doing something that did not require space age technology or or lost civilizations from other worlds that they simply lifted up uh, the hard pan uh, that covered the lighter soils underneath that is the darker uh, covering pulled back uh, would reveal the lines you see here of contrasting color uh, removing in other words surface stones to expose the lighter colored earth beneath but not in haphazard fashion but in regular geometrical uh, shapes uh, triangles circles and even effigy shapes like the dog here and, and and what was the significance well again we don't have to resort to mystery what have we learned from the history of empires where monumental undertakings are concerned whether it it be the great rock carvings of Persia or the burial tombs of China. Why is it that the human species feels the need to signify its existence in such incredible and monumental form? Well, from China to Persia to Rome to Peru, it seems uh, it is the aesthetic compulsion of our species, our big box brains and the imaginations they produce to signify not only our existence uh, but that of the natural world and perhaps its connection to earthly and uh, heavenly uh, empires. Even in places that Europeans regarded as primordial wilderness by their own standards. There is evidence that native peoples engineered landscapes to support their populations. Consider the modern day Amazon. Uh, we decry the deforestation of the Amazon uh, and yet it seems that with each grove of Amazonian, Amazonian forest that is removed by modern bulldozers and chainsaws, uh, we discover or should I say rediscover evidence of ancient civilization uh, that once flourished in regions now overgrown by equatorial rainforest. That is, uh, we are not the first to clear uh, forest or clear landscapes for habitation. Um, here the geoglyphs of Acre in the now deforested area of western Brazil show that native peoples engineered landscapes in the Amazonian rainforest long before the arrival of, of Europeans to suit their own needs. They cleared trees and built geometrically precise agricultural, agricultural terraces to produce food. These were not aliens from another world. These were not, uh, you know, lost civilizations made up of people uh, who were superhuman. Uh, these are civilizations uh, that were ultimately eclipsed by European arrival or the reconquest of environments, but they were made by human beings. The ancestors of native peoples uh, of the Americas uh, to suit their own needs, uh, to provide for the material basis for their populations 
just as other uh, civilizations have done uh, since the dawn of civilization. And the region in the middle between North America and South America is the region we call Middle or Mesoamerica. And it is perhaps more familiar to us because of the great stone pyramids, for example, of the Mayan people uh, who built urban centers, uh, concentrated city populations of people during their classic era of 200 to 900 CE. That is of the Mayan civilizations of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and of Guatemala, what we call Mesoamerica. Tikal here, a major urban center of the Maya, hosted a population of 50,000 people in the city core, surrounded by another 50,000 uh, in the uh, hinterland or countryside. Uh, it's hard for us at first to imagine today because again nature has reclaimed much of this uh, area but once we clear the trees we see uh, the landscape as it would have looked perhaps to the Maya. Um, ceremonial centers, urban cores, farming hinterlands, all of it supported the great Mayan urban civilizations. Not a single political governing entity, but a network of governing cities, each with its own monarch, each with its own kingly figure that at various times stood in confederacy with one another and at other times were, of course, great rivals. These cities supported craft manufacturing in addition to monumental art architecture, handcraft manufacturing that became the basis for a trade economy of luxury goods, uh, objects carved from jade or from gold, uh, precious shells, uh, feathers, and of course cacao, that is the indulgent um, uh, bean that produces chocolate. Uh, chocolate itself was a pre-Columbian um, artifact and it was the basis of a trading culture that spread throughout uh, the region of Mesoamerica, as you see here uh, on this inset map. Two great civilizations actually dominated Mesoamerica during the classical era. The first we've mentioned was the Maya, centered mostly in Guatemala and the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Like ancient Mesopotamia or Greece, say, the Mayan civilization was composed of independent city-states that were connected through trade and culture and war. And the Maya developed quite sophisticated means of communication, including a system of writing that used glyphs, that is, figures carved into rocks, uh, picture symbols, really, that stood as phonetic symbols, the same way that the Phoenician letters uh, or the Greek alphabet letters uh, do uh, today. Uh, these were symbols to be spoken, uh, not simply like the Egyptian hieroglyphs as images to be interpreted, but actual phonetic symbols in a written system of language that uh, represented mostly the economic and ceremonial interests of the Mayan elite. Tikal was connected by trade, diplomacy, and conquest uh, along with the other Mayan city-states to the second of the two great civilizations of Mesoamerica, that of Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan, situated in the central highland valley of Mexico, uh, just uh, a short drive really from modern Mexico City, Teotihuacan was a dominant imperial power during the classic era and rivaled the Maya. Perhaps upwards of 200,000 people lived in the city that the later Aztec people called the City of the Gods. Uh, we don't know what the Teotihuacanos themselves called it because no evidence of their language has yet been interpreted. Uh, but at the time of Spanish arrival, it was the Aztecs who told the Spaniards of the city of the gods, the Ciudad de los Dioses, um, 
where huge pyramids, uh, rock cut, uh, brick and stone pyramids, like the Pyramid of the Sun, as you see here, dominating the landscape of what was a ceremonial plaza, where it is imagined that great processional parades, perhaps military parades or ritualistic parades uh, and processions made their way uh, to the ceremonial centers past the Great Pyramids. Like ancient Rome and its processional roads, Teotihuacan was the center of an empire that had a radius of some 10,000 square miles. And so the great wealth of that empire was expended here in the building of these elaborate ceremonial plazas and pyramids uh, to the everlasting grandeur of the civilizations who built them. Mesoamerica's ecologies of civilization define the growth of environmental confidence power and culture during the classic era and as always it relied on the engineering feats of agriculture and food production uh, the famous chinampas or floating gardens of central mexico in the valley of central mexico the high elevation valley of central america uh, these were floating gardens built uh, on lake tops that supported up to three harvests of maize annually the alluvial soils nutrient rich soils of the lake bottom would be dredged up onto floating platforms where great harvests of maize for example were cultivated up to three times a year to feed the growing urban population so not only uh, a, a remarkable feat of food production but a remarkable feat of basic human engineering as well the humanizing again of landscapes food crops first cultivated in mesoamerica included maize and squash and tomatoes and avocados think about this next time you go to the grocery store your produce section guavas chili peppers manioc agave prickly pear, black raspberries, strawberries, the list goes on and on, sunflower seeds, and of course cacao from which chocolate was made. These are all Native American food crops, most of them Mesoamerican food crops that after the arrival of Europeans will be transported uh, and, uh, uh, and, and implanted uh, globally. Uh, what what would Italian food be without tomato? T t Italian red sauce be without tomatoes? What would Thai food be without chili peppers? Uh, or uh, or for that matter, what would C's chocolate be or Ghirardelli chocolate be without the cacao bean? In other words, Native American peoples developing the agricultural food crops that would ultimately help feed a global population in the era of the Colombian exchange. So an almost totally engineered landscape is what we find in Mesoamerica as the aerial photographs attest, but one must uh, use one must one must use one's imagination to clear away much of the overgrowth to understand that in their own times these engineered landscapes, these humanized landscapes represented the same pattern of civilization that we've studied globally. As Robert Strayer writes, they drained swamps, terraced hillsides, flattened ridge tops, and constructed an elaborate water management system. Much of this in support of a flourishing agriculture, which supported a very rapidly growing and dense population by 750 CE. Again, Strayer speaking of the Mayan and Mesoamerican civilizations, calling to mind, for example, the pattern of Roman Empire with its humanized landscapes and elaborate irrigation and water management system, just as the great Roman aqueducts brought water to the city from the Italian countryside, so too did the Maya engineer their own water delivery systems. With a total Mayan population estimated to have been about 5 million or more, the ecology of Mesoamerica depended on food production and available resources, none of which was simply there for the taking. It all had to be constructed. It all had to be engineered. Uh, deforestation, most likely the result, along with soil erosion, combined 
uh, with what uh, climate scientists believe was a prolonged drought beginning in the 800s, triggering an age of collapse and conflict as city-states warred with each other. That is, once perhaps allies, now rivals warred over available resources. We need not resort to fantasy, to mythology, to account for the eclipse of ancient native civilizations any more than we do to account for the decline of ancient Rome or Persia or Greece or China. Uh, it was the ethnocentric cultural biases of Europeans who kept them from understanding this process, who kept them from, I think, properly attributing to the native peoples of pre-Columbian America the same agency, the same human agency, including the same ultimate dependency on the environment that other great civilizations throughout time have cultivated, creating both a basis for their grandeur, but also the roots of dependency that ultimately claimed them as victims of failed environmental policies. And it's this Mayan mural depicting war, just as we've seen from the Mediterranean and Egyptian and other depictions of civilizations in decline. It always seems that war is the agent that comes as a result of environmental mismanagement and that war is the agent responsible for turning out the lights on a civilization. You would think it would be a lesson that we had learned better, but uh, well, you know, history tends to go in circles because man tends to forget. All right, so thank you. That is the end of our Native American Empires lecture. Uh, you can check out the rest of the lectures pertaining to our theme of empire, of course, on D2L as you prepare for your unit exam.